aim high this morning. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Please stand if you are able as we worship together.
Psalm 91, verse 9 to 16. If you make the Lord your refuge, and if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras, and you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me, and I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble, and I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation.
be seated. Thank you so much, worship team. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just so you're aware, this, this exact group, this worship team, will be uh, leading worship tonight uh, here at Portage Avenue Church. We have a worship night. We are doing it with uh, Westwood Community Church, and it will be happening here at Portage Avenue. So you are all welcome. It is a worship night. You're going to get to hear testimonies of God's faithfulness in people's lives, and our young people, our young adults are going to be leading it, and we are so excited. So we are thankful to get a little bit of a taste right now, but there's more to come. Uh, I wanted to also just make you aware in the bulletin, next week we have it added rather quickly, so I want to make you aware of that, but a good friend of mine, and someone I really respect, and he's a great preacher, is Pierre Gilbert, and he is coming to speak next Sunday, and one of the reasons we wanted him to speak next Sunday is a couple weeks ago, he actually did a seminar with our staff about proper preparation and readying yourself for preaching, and some of the steps that he takes in his own life to prepare himself to speak in front of others and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we have asked him as part of the training for our staff if he would now put it into practice, what he shared with us. And so he is coming to preach. He's an Old Testament professor, so the chances are you're going to get something from the Old Testament, but uh, that is why he's coming. And I mean, we love having him every year, but there's quite, there, there's more intentionality this particular time. So make yourself aware you're going to, it's going to be a, quite a treat. Pierre Gilbert will be here with us next Sunday sharing God's word. Yes, amen. Also, uh, if you're not aware, uh, actually all of that was already shared. Thank you so much, Pastor Scott, for your opening. I don't know, I don't need to repeat uh, what was already shared. Uh, I want to, today we're going to talk about uh, one verse, just one verse. And you think to yourself, well, how long could Pastor Jedediah go on just one verse? I am telling you, I've had to cut down so much to get this in a proper time frame. Uh, I want you to also note that if you're wondering where I'm going, where my points are, my points are all written down in the bulletin. They're actually the first four questions. They, my points are questions. This is a sermon where I am going to ask you a question because I believe the text is asking that of us. And you're going to go home because I can't answer it for you. You are going to go home and wrestle with these questions. The first four are the questions and they are my main points in the entire sermon today. So let's, let's begin. Uh, before we actually read from 2 Timothy, I... I when we started this journey of discipleship training, it, it came from a place when I spent time with the Lord and I felt the Lord saying, discipleship. We're coming through this pandemic, Lord willing, and I felt the Lord emphasizing discipleship, discipleship, discipleship. And I have to be honest with you, I don't have good strategies. I don't have this process. I don't have a system in place that is this effective way, you know, I could give you the seven tips, the seven steps that'll make you effective for discipling other people for Jesus Christ. I don't have it. Maybe you do. And then you should come on up here and share one Sunday. Uh, for me, it's always been, one, I have to be available, which, by the way, is really hard in our busy, busy day, right? But make myself available. Make my calendar available to be flexible to meet with people. Secondly, it's always been listening. One-on-one, -on -one, I have to just sit there and listen. And the third one, I have to be willing when I am asked to share my story of Jesus' work in my life. That's what I have done for years. And I think sometimes we are looking for like some magic pill that'll give us the way to do this most effectively. We want programs, seminars, certain processes to share the news, this good news of Jesus Christ. And I just wonder sometimes, have we overthought just a tad, just overthought it a little bit? It's not that it's not important, but I want to ask you this. When you go and have coffee with somebody, do you sit in the mirror before you go and have coffee with that person 
and rehearse everything you're about to say to that person. I mean, you rehearse your questions that you ask them. Do you rehearse uh, what, what, you rehearse your family. You tell, you know, you go over your family names. You know, who your mom is and your dad is. And, and oh, and my, and I have a brother and a sister and their name is. Do you rehearse that in the mirror? I've never done that. I think it would be odd if I came to you, if you came, if I came to your house or we went to have coffee and I had pre-scripted texts ready for you. It would be stale, rather mechanical. It would seem strange, wouldn't it? Now, I am not speaking about if you're speaking in front of a crowd of people, like what we're doing on a Sunday morning. There does need to be some kind of a script. I have translators out there that are looking at my text going, where are you going? But I have an outline for them. But I'm speaking about one-on-one, -on -one because discipleship, one-on-one, -on -one, we, don't, we, don't, we don't script it all. And I think we're wanting that, and I don't think that's what we should be doing. Because when I look at the early church, I don't see an elaborate process. I mean, there is discipleship, there's training. But what I see most of all when I read the letters, when I read 2 Timothy, I, I, see, I see a willing heart. A willing heart that's willing to share their story when the opportunity arises. They don't have like a set system like, well, when the person asks this question, that's when you share this. That's just not how it worked. I mean, this is the early church. They didn't have some of the formalities that we even have today. It wasn't all rehearsed. Sometimes it wasn't even very eloquent. I mean, you can read the Apostle Peter's words. Sometimes it wasn't very eloquent. But yet, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God used that which often is considered foolish by the world standards. And I want you to know it had a significant impact in the world. And I am telling you this today because I think Paul gives us some really great tips on how to do discipleship. But it is not this mechanical rehearsed. Here's the seven steps. It's rather he's asking some really thoughtful questions. He's challenging Timothy. And that's why we wanted to go through Timothy, 2 Timothy. Because we have an elder, a man that is on his, he's really facing death in prison. And he's speaking to a younger Timothy, one whom he has discipled. And there's so much we can learn about how Paul speaks to Timothy and trains and, and instructs and encourages Timothy. And I hope you will take some of this and you will say, okay, I'm going to go and now ask my neighbor who I've been praying for for years to go and have coffee with me. Or if they're not comfortable with coffee or they don't like coffee, you know, invite them over to have some dainties. That's a word I learned out here in Canada, dainties. I love that word. <laughs> so that's why we're going through this today and for the foreseeable future. Uh, so let's read the one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It's just one verse. Here it is. That is why, okay, already Paul is saying that is why. He's referring to something else. I need you to know that just previously the Apostle Paul is talking about his, uh, his calling, that he is an apostle who has been teaching, preaching, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, because of my preaching, because of my teaching, that is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. I want you to know that right away when I read this particular verse, and I didn't go any further because I was stuck on this verse this week. When I thought of this verse, I said, there is a focus to this man. A focus, a drive that I wish at times I had. I mean, I, I'm pretty passionate Pretty enthusiastic, but there is a passion that goes beyond just words. 
We can all say amen and hallelujah. It's another thing when you are in prison, suffering, and you speak the words that you are speaking. There is just a particular temperament and a focus that I think we as a church that we don't see often in the affluent societies in the West. And I think we need to regain that. In order to better illustrate it, I want to actually give you another story. And it's a story I have brought up time and time again. I I brought it up a couple weeks ago. It's actually in my annual report that I wrote. So you're saying, well, you're just repeating? I can't get past it. Because as I've been praying during this season of time, as I've been seeking the Lord during this pandemic, my heart is just so hurting inside. Because I see so much division and so much pain and so much turmoil on every front, families, churches, businesses, all around. And maybe you don't see it in your life, but as a pastor, I'm experiencing it on a daily basis, and it's heavy. And I'm praying, and I'm saying, Lord, what is our response? Our response cannot be scripted by the media, by the Winnipeg Free Press or the CBC News. Our narrative, our story needs to be something else, something other. Because we are telling a story that is a true story of God's historical work that will bring hope and healing and redemption to this world. How do we share this? How do we stop focusing on all the problems? Do you ever get stuck on the problems and it just puts you in a terrible place? Like you just can't see a way out because you're just focused on all the problems. There's problems here. There's problems there. There's problems in my marriage. There's problems with my kids. There's problems in the church. There's problems at work. There's problems around the world. And you just get focused on the problems. And it just torments you. Am I the only one that has that problem? Okay, good. Somebody said no. Wow. For the one person I'm preaching to you today. Hallelujah. Uh, so, so, so... I, I've, been, I've been really processing this in my, in my own life because I'm saying, Lord, i got to get off the problem. It's not helping me. It's not helping the church. It's not helping anybody. Nobody wants a visit from their pastor who's down in the dumps, right? You want to be encouraged, empowered, not have a pastor come in and say, oh, Jesus, help us. Pray for me. You know, like, come on. So... I'm, 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 <laughs> I, this is what I've been battling personally. I want you to hear this because I think it's important. I don't think I'm alone. And so the Lord has just brought this, this, this story to me that I've read a million times. I know you all have re- read it so many times about Jesus walking on the water. You, you have th- these disciples that are on a boat. They're trying to go to the other side of the lake and they're, they're, they're dealing with the waves the wind, the turbulent behavior, and it's not just for an hour. They're there all, almost all night trying to get to the other side of the lake. They're exhausted. They are completely and utterly uh, gassed. They have no, I mean, they're at the end of their abilities here. And Jesus shows up at three in the morning walking by them. And right away, the disciples think this is a ghost, right? Because it could be because they're exhausted. But what would you think if you saw somebody walking on the water? What would you think? I'm going crazy or there's something going on here. And they're all fearing. And Jesus says, uh, says, uh, do not fear. Be courageous. Take heart. It's I. And at that point, Peter does not allow his fear to captivate him. But what he ends up doing is he says, if you are the Lord, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come. As Peter gets out of the boat, listen to this. This is ridiculous. This is courageous on Peter's end. That would not be what I would be asking. What would you be asking? Could you calm the storm so we could get to the other side? We've been working at it all night. But Peter has this... (laughs) bold claim that he wants to do what Jesus is doing. And he says, well, let me come out there. And Jesus says, come. And so he gets out there and 
To his surprise, he's walking on the water. He's looking to Jesus. There's turbulent water. There's the waves and the wind. Everything that could be going on all around him. But he's looking to Jesus. And he looks to Jesus and he's walking on the water. Even in the midst of all of the turbulent uh, environment around him. The waves that are crashing in. He's walking on the water. And what happens when he takes his eyes off of Jesus? When he focuses upon the problem, what happens? He starts to sink. And he cries out to Jesus, help me. And Jesus helps him. And then Jesus says, why did you, why did you not trust me? See, if he had kept his eyes on Jesus, the storms are still going to be happening. They're still going on. But he was rising above them. Because his focus was upon Jesus Christ. I want you to know that as a, a, a young man in college, I did surf. I was from California. I mean, that's like a stereotype of Californians, right? That we all surf. We don't, by the way. But when I went to college, I was by the ocean. And yes, I did some uh, surfing. And I want you to know that those waves, when there's a nice storm, those waves are dangerous. They are intimidating. I've been out on a storm. You always want to go during a storm because the waves are the biggest. And I want you to know that when I first started surfing, and I was not an impressive surfer, so don't get any picture of me, what you see on TV, okay? But when I first started surfing, I want you to know, when those huge waves came my way, you know what would happen? I didn't know what to do. I freezed up. And you know what would happen every time? They'd come down on me and crush me. And they would spin me all throughout under the water to where I couldn't figure out where my up or down was. I'd be so spun around by the wave that I would sometimes hit my head at the bottom of the water, thinking I was going up. I know that seems strange, but that's how hard it hits you. It takes your breath away. And then you drag yourself back to shore, <laughs> defeated. But as you get more advanced, you realize not only do you want these large waves, but you learn how to navigate them. You face them. You realize how to navigate them or work through the waves. And I believe this is what Jesus in this story is trying to teach us as a church. That nothing is impossible with Jesus Christ. Remember, it is, he can do far beyond anything we could ever imagine or even think because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within us. And so we have a circumstance that might seem insurmountable. It could be the pandemic. It could be whatever is going on in society at this time. Whatever conflict there is. And he is asking of us to press in and to look to him because he is the one that has the solution to all these problems. It is not too great for Jesus Christ. It isn't. If we want to navigate these treacherous waters we cannot just avoid it or freeze up. We got to look to Jesus because he's the one that's going to get us through the waters. Amen? Now, I tell you this and you're going, well, I thought we were going through 2 Timothy. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this right now because there is this constant focus that I see in the early church. This desire that Jesus has for the disciples to look to not the problem, but the solution. You see it over and over again in the biblical text. The, the disciples are arguing, and Jesus throws out a little story and says, well, and to shift their thinking, to stop focusing on the problem, and to focus upon the solution. You see it over and over again. Go through God, Jesus' teachings. And I think we need to be reminded of that, that even at this very stage in 2 Timothy, as Paul is in prison, and he's in prison not because of anything other than preaching and teaching God's word. He makes that very clear to us. And he says, I am not ashamed. He is not just mentioning, by saying that, he's not just saying uh, or giving us an acclamation of courage. He's not just saying, I'm courageous for God's kingdom. That's not what he's getting at. When he says, I am not ashamed, you have to understand that in the ancient world, to, 
to be in prison and to possibly die a criminal is, would, would, would tarnish the Apostle Paul's reputation. It would tarnish anybody's reputation that was connected to the Apostle Paul in the world standards. And Paul is reminding Timothy, he's reminding him to keep his focus upon Jesus and that the current condition that he has found himself in, in this world, will not dictate his value. He does not let the world define him. But his identity is truly in the living God. He's saying, I am not ashamed. I'm not going to allow the world and the standards of this world and what other people are saying to define me. I am not defined by that. My definition, how I am defined is by the living God. And I am, know I am at peace with the living God. I am doing what God has called me to do. And by the way, this is a great sermon to preach. Is this not hard to live out? I mean, it's really easy for me to get up here and say, your identity is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And everybody says, amen. And then I say to you, um, and by the way, uh, when Paul was saying that, he was in prison and getting ready to die. How do we feel about that? How do we feel about the world and our society? How would we feel if Canada completely turned on us and completely said, no more? Preaching, teaching, what you're, what's, what's in God's word, no more. Are we ready? Are we ready for that? Because that's what Paul is saying. It's easy to talk about it. Do we want to really live it out? Because that is what Paul is saying. Paul is not going to find his value in what others are thinking. You have to imagine, Paul not only lost status within society, but who knows what his friendships were like. We know even in 2 Timothy, there were people within Christian communities that left him. He was all but abandoned. But he said, I will not be shamed by this society because my value is in Jesus Christ. So my first question to you, I can't answer it for you. It's something that I'm wrestling with in my own life. Where is your identity? And if we are investing in other people's lives, we have to, in, to remind them of where their identity is. It's in Jesus. We can't keep drawing value because of our society thinks of us, what our family thinks of us. We need to ask the harder question, what does Jesus think of us? That is my first question to you. Let's go to the second question. And it comes out of Paul's response that I know the one whom I trust. Now, it's important for you to know that when Paul, especially in the Greek, is saying, I know, he's not just talking about a mental, a mental process. I know he's talking about this focus, this attention, his eyes and perception to whom he trusts, but it doesn't just come from a thought process. It's actually an experience. He's not talking about a creed. This is the early church. He's talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that no relationship is built upon neglect, ignoring each other, finding time whenever it's maybe convenient, once, I don't know, a month. That's not a healthy relationship. Any healthy marriage, you know you prioritize the other, do you not? If you want a healthy relationship. I mean, please, people that have had a functional, healthy marriage, you know that, right? We all can say that? Well, a relationship with Jesus Christ, he knows whom he trusts. He's in relationship with him. It's a priority in his life. And so my next question, and I'm rushing through this because I want to make sure we get through it. 
I've got a few more questions for you, is where do you place your trust? You even see Jesus, when we were talking about the, uh, Jesus walking on the water, just prior to walking on the water, what does Jesus do? He finds a place of solitude to spend with the living God. We are willing to trust in so many things that are terminal. I've seen people trust in governments, organizational structures, corporations, humanitarian causes, interest groups, activist groups, and all of them are terminal. They're all going to let you down because they're human constructs. But there is only one that you can place your trust in beyond even your own family that will never, that will be, that will be trustworthy with his word. And that is the living God. He is the greatest thing you can trust, the greatest person you can trust in this world, in this galaxy. And we often have so many misguided ties to other things. So where do you place your trust? Paul makes it really clear, in the midst of great suffering, whom does he trust? I know who I trust. That did not just come from some creed. That came from a relationship with the living God. It's time spent with the living God so that he built that trust because he invested in God and God invested in him. That's how a relationship works. And thus, he knows where he's going. And he knows the plan ahead. Let's go to the next question. As we come to the end of this verse, there is a, there's quite a bit of uncertainty. Can you put that verse back up? And, and then we will go to the, the third question. But if you could put that, that, that verse up, I'd greatly appreciate it. Where is your identity? Uh, the verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. There it is. There it is. Uh, you're going to see here, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Now, in most of your Bibles, you will see a little uh, indication asterisk that will direct you to the bottom of your Bible, because there's a lot of uncertainty how you actually interpret this line. It could say, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return which we see in the New Living Translation. That's what they've decided. But they're a little unsure because at the bottom of the page they say, or it could say, and here's what it could say. It could say, quote, what he, what has been entrusted to me. Let me say that again. Is it, God, is it what has been entrusted to him or what God has entrusted to me? I mean, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great difference. And scholars are unsure about it, and there's a lot of discussion about it. And translators are not sure about it, and you can go and look in most of your Bibles, you'll see both of those interpretations. Now, I am not thinking we are going to resolve this uh, dilemma. I'm not, a, I'm not a translator, and, you know, there's, there's been centuries of people arguing about this. But I do want to stimulate our conversation here and say that maybe, just maybe, Paul intended to leave it as such. Meaning both translations, both interpretations he wanted us to be considering. What I'm getting at is a relationship has always been a two-way street. I invest in somebody's life, I share a little bit of my life, they invest in my life and, and share in my life. I mean, it goes back and forth. Their life, my life. Back and forth, right? It's a two-way street. If, if I'm the only one sharing and no one's sharing their life, there's nothing going on, they're not investing in the relationship, it usually doesn't go anywhere. And Paul is speaking about a relationship. And so the question that I have for you is what is it that we are called to be guarding for God? And what are we asking God to guard for us? This entrusting imagery that is found within the ancient world is, is like a safeguarding, a deposit. So let's talk about what is it? What is it that God is depositing with us, with Paul? We've said it time and time again. Paul is in prison. 
in prison because of his faithfulness to God's word. And God, and we know that Paul was asked to teach and preach as an apostle. So what has God deposited to us, given to us? It's this. It's this right here. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's God's redemptive plan. And I know for some of us, it's a rather strange, some of you might even say, well, that's not much of a gift. No, 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 it is. Some of you might say, well, okay, um, all right, uh, God's redemptive plan. No, 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 this is the greatest gift that could be given to anybody for all of humanity. And I wonder sometimes, we have such a hard time at, at sharing our story, don't we? And sharing the goodness of God. I don't see that in the early church. I want you to know that if you had, let's just, let's just be up front, if you had a cure for cancer and you kept it in, you held it from society, and millions and millions of people died of cancer, what kind of book would be written about you? I don't know. I mean, I've had a lot, this is very personal for me. A lot of my family has died of cancer. I mean, my goodness, we want a cure. The Carpentiers keep dropping like flies with cancer. What would society say of you? Wouldn't you be considered a barbarian, the worst of all, that you had a cure and you withheld it? Wouldn't that be terrible? See, the early church saw the good news of Jesus Christ as that which would bring healing and cure the disease of that society and the society today. We have a cancer and it's called sin and it is eating us up inside. It torments us, it plagues us, it keeps us from living as we were originally intended to do so. And thus, humanity has emptiness inside. There's a void inside. And it doesn't matter how hard we try or how many idols we put in front of us. By the way, an idol is just, a, is just a, uh, an imitation of something that is real. We keep putting these idols in front of our lives to fill the temporary emptiness. Well, it's a lasting emptiness, but to fill us temporarily. And it continually, we fail. There is a deadly disease. And the early church realized how glaring and how deprived humanity was. And so they went out there and they gladly shared it. It wasn't an option. All society was saying, don't do it. They said, no, there's not an option. We have the cure. It's a humanitarian crisis. We cannot withhold this. We would be the worst of all criminals if we were to withhold that which can bring healing in people's lives. Even if they reject it, we have to share it because we have the cure to the disease that is called sin within this society. God has entrusted us with it. He has deposited it to us. And yet, oftentimes, we're too, I don't know, concerned about sharing it. We're concerned about what others might think. We don't want to come across too pushy. I don't think the early church cared much for that. They knew that there was an epidemic, a, a real pandemic, that was going to last for an eternity. And they got out there and they shared it with others. They were willing to put their lives on the line because it was that important it wasn't just good news, oh, it's a nice thought process. No, this was what would transform lives. It was what will bring healing, and so we gotta get out there, and we gotta share our faith. That is the third question. Is your faith being shared? Because God has deposited his word with us, and it's not meant to be like a bank where we hold it in. It's meant to go out and share it with others. That is what God has given us. We are stewards of that. And by the way, it's a, it's a deposit which will be collected in time. So we all, if you declare Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, every one of us will have to give an account. That's the imagery that Paul is making here. We got to get out there. 
I'm not saying you bulldoze people over and hit them with the Bible. I'm just saying we have to be willing to share it. That is our mandate. It's not an option, actually. It's not meant to be kept within. It's meant to go out because it is that which will cure the problems of this world. Lastly, we see that uh, we, we now ask, well, what have we entrusted to God? What have we deposited with God? And I hope you see this very clearly because what it, what it is, is our life. God has asked for our life, all of it. And this is so difficult because what we often do is if you have a cure for something, medicine, and you were to mix it with something else, you would dilute the medicine, would you not? You could actually even harm someone. I mean, let's be honest, if you mix it with gasoline, how's that gonna feel? Mix it with poison, what will happen to you? If we dilute the gospel, remember, we are called to guard it because this is the cure for humanity. We have to uphold God's word. And in order to do that, we have to give our life to God. That is what we are depositing to God, our life, all of it. I want you to know this at the forefront. If you're watching this on the live stream or you're here today, God is not asking for just a part of your life. There are so many Christians that have given only a small part of their life to Jesus Christ. And they never experience the fullness that God speaks about. They never experience all that God has for them, what they read about in God's word. And so because of that, they face defeat after defeat because they've only given a small portion to God. And then what ends up happening is they become bitter and cynical and they actually over time hurt the kingdom work. I've seen it time and time again. We are not called to go part-time. This, uh, this is not an after-school program. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's, Jesus is asking for all of our life, everything, all of it. Paul makes that really clear, his own physical well-being. He's asking for everything. If you want to experience what God shares and what God teaches in his word, if you want to be effective for God's kingdom, it starts here. You have to give all of your life to him. You have to say, come Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you to lead. I know I have my set ways. I know I have my traditions. I know I think what is best, but I'm asking you to transform me and lead me by the power of your Holy Spirit. That's what it takes. And it's not just in words, it's in action. And I know some of you probably don't like that and you say, you know what, let's just get Johnny into the church. Well, let's not lie to little Johnny. Let's tell him the truth. It requires everything. So that when Johnny does give his life to Jesus Christ and submits it all to Jesus Christ, he experiences the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Not some cheap invitation. We've been so soft in the church. Young people are looking to be challenged. They're not looking for some soft, watered-down gospel. They don't want it. Somebody give me an amen? amen? So let's challenge them. Jesus, if you're investing in someone's life, be upfront about it. Say it's a life commitment, and it's a struggle for me. There's days where I can say I haven't given my full. There's days where I've, where I've sprinkled in my own desires with God's will for me. I've had good days. I've had bad days. But when you're investing in someone's life, be up front. Tell them it's a daily battle. And it's something that I complete, every day I have to give my life and say, Lord, I need to submit my life to you, all of it, so that you can lead. If you want others to experience the fullness of what God has in store for their lives, we have to live it out. And we have to share and be upfront with others that we invest in, that we are discipling, that this is an all. It is not a little bit. It's everything. And it requires everything of us. But if we do so, we will discover the fullness 
that God is speaking about in his word. We will experience healing in our lives. And it will go with us for all of eternity. It is the greatest story. It is the good news. It is the best news you could tell anybody about. And that is why it is so important that we ask ourselves this question. Have you given all of your life to Jesus? It is a question. It's a daily question for me. Because there's days where I can say, no, I didn't. I did my own will. But it's something we need to wrestle with. And I think it's something we need to ask those that we're investing in. We need to challenge them. Because it's not because we're trying to condemn them. We're not the accusatory people. That's the enemy. We're doing it because we want them to find healing and restoration. And far too often, we're throwing softball pitches. I'm sorry if you play softball. But we're throwing very soft pitches at people. Instead of presenting what will transform their life. Let us be the church. Let us wrestle with these questions. You see them up on the overhead. Ask yourself these questions, and I hope you can take them with you as you meet with others and share your faith with other people. I want you to know today that we have had uh, so much going on in the last 18, 19 months. And I, I just, I want, I want Jeremy to come on up and uh, I want him to just sing a song. And it goes back to what I originally said when we started today. And it's simply this, we've got to turn our eyes upon Jesus. I know there's a lot of frustrations right now in our society. There's a lot of frustrations even in our home. We got to get our focus right, church family. And we got to get it on Jesus. Amen? So we're going to sing. And if you can stand, I'm not at, if, if you're not able, I understand. But if you are able to stand, could we just sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? Jeremy, are you there? Good. Thank you, brother. I thought we were going to have a repeat. You may be seated. <laughs> Wonderful, though. If today you're saying, I, I need to turn my eyes upon Jesus. I want to give my life to him. I want to give all of it to him. Because I need healing. And I need God to work within my life and take care of the dark facets, those recesses in your life that you know you haven't dealt with in your life. And you're saying, I need Jesus to enter into even the darkest facets of my life and bring healing. If you're saying yes to Jesus right now, then I want to pray with you because it is Jesus that will break down the strongholds in your life and rebuild your life and give you a new beginning. And so let us go before the living God. Lord Jesus, we need you. We recognize how much we need you today. And we lay before you our mess, our sin, all that it is, Lord, whether it be our arrogance, our willingness to continually disobey you, whatever it might be, we lay it before you. And we ask, Lord Jesus, for you to enter in. We want to give our lives to you. Help us to not be distracted by all that is going on around us. And help us to look to you. To look to you, to spend time with you, so that we can be transformed. Help us to build this relationship of trust. Lord, we cry out for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If today you said this prayer for the first time, uh, or maybe it's been a long time, and you're saying, I need to renew my commitment with Jesus Christ. If you're saying that today, please come and find me. If, you, if you're not comfortable with me, I understand. That can be intimidating, but if there's someone sitting next to you, I'm, I'm sure there's someone sitting next to you on these pews that know Jesus. Let them walk with you. And if you're on the live stream, we have our contact information. You can access any of our staff. We would just love for you to be in community because this journey is meant to be done together. Amen? All right. 
I, I want to thank you again for joining us. I want to say a few words. We're going to continue to have fellowship uh, in the lower auditorium. We have the tables and the chairs situated as such, so please, please keep them where they are located. I appreciate that, and I want to have these words for each one of you and say that Jesus loves you, and I pray that you would experience that love because it is that love that will sustain you and keep you for all of eternity. I want to thank you again for joining us, and I hope to see you next week at this time. Blessings. Bye-bye. Thank you.